Well, we scheduled this series on the elements of healthy relationships so that both Mother's Day and Father's Day would be a part of it. And I recognize that each person's experience of those two days is different depending on whether or not we had or have a good relationship with our mother and our dad or whether our parents are still living or have died. But I thought it would be good today to look at a Bible story that focuses on two women who are each in the course of their lives, daughters, wives, and mothers. Naomi is the mother-in-law of Ruth. My mother always called Jill her daughter in love, which I think has a much nicer sound, and I think Naomi certainly would have called Ruth her daughter in love. Now, the story of Naomi is found in the book of Ruth, which takes place at a time in Israel's history when there is no king. The book begins, it was in the days the judges ruled. And there was also no food. There was a time of famine in the land. And much like the poor and desperate people who we see today trying to get from North Africa to Italy or from Mexico to the United States or from Getting to, trying to get to Turkey from Syria or other places in the world, Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons make the risky decision to flee their home in the hope of a better life. According to a report I read this week by the United States Commission on Religious Freedom, right now there are over 13 million people in the world who have been displaced by religious conflict alone. Well, Naomi and her family, they leave Bethlehem, which is about five miles south of Jerusalem. They head southeast, traveling 20 to perhaps some 30-odd miles, east of the Dead Sea, south of the river Arnon, to the land of Moab. Now, the Israelites believed that they were related distantly to the Moabites through the nephew of Abraham, whose name was Lot. You can read about that back in Genesis 19. But during exodus out of Egypt, the Moabites would not give the Israelites any food or any water. So that created a real serious breach and sense of tension between them, so much so that in Deuteronomy 23, where it's talking about who can, how do you worship and everything, it says that no Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. They were barred. It'd be like us having a sign on the door. If you're from this country, you can't come in to our worship service. So can you see where that might generate some hard feelings of both of these experiences over time? And yet, the situation for Naomi's family is so desperate and so dire that they decide they've got a better chance there than they do in the land of Judah. So they go, and the situation grows much worse for Naomi's family because her husband dies leaving her and her two sons even more vulnerable. Thankfully, though, the the men grow up, they each marry local girls. But sadly, after they lived in Moabite and Moab for about 10 years, about 10 years, both of Naomi's sons died. I mean, can you imagine? Leaving their wives as widows and their mother with no husband, no sons, no children. So try to imagine what it must feel like to be living in an unfamiliar country, to lose, if you're Naomi, the three members of your immediate family, and to feel alone and unsupported with nowhere to turn for help. You might be surprised that we actually have a number of people at BBC who were born and raised in another country, but who married someone from the United States, and who, like Naomi, don't have a lot of their family of origin and relatives close by. And one of the benefits of being part of a church like this is that we can provide the kind of love and support that we all need, even if we don't have immediate family right around us, as Naomi no longer did. And that's one of the values of our mom-to-mom group, which meets on Thursday mornings. It's a place where moms can find compassion, acceptance, kindness, and empathy as they seek to raise their children. And we actually have a video today that we want to show you. That's five of our moms talking about what that group means to them this Mother's Day. So we'll bring the lights down and cue the video. 
I think it's great because you can come and share problems that you're having at home with the kids or successes that you have and you know that at least someone in this group has probably experienced at least one or, <laughs> or many of the same things. And so you know that it's a safe kind of place to discuss it. It's, it's been interesting for me because I think I've been coming uh, to Mom to Mom for nine years now. Um, <laughs> And so I started out as, you know, maybe one of the younger moms, um, and the mom-to-mom the -mom is based on the Titus II, where the older women in the church are instructed to, um, you know, help the, the women of the church to raise their children in their marriages. So over the course of the years now, I've become one of the older moms, and um, it's, it's been a lot of fun, a lot of support. Um, and every year, you know, you come back, and it's, it's a, kind of a new group of women, um, you have your kids are a different age. You're going through different problems with them, and like Jenny said, it, there's always somebody there that's either giving advice or just welcoming advice from from seasoned moms. For me, mom to mom is uh, a very important group. It's kind of my little family too, especially since I came from another country and uh, just feeling that people accept me as I am um, and help me. To get through my oh my gosh, it's called dying. We do a lot of crying. We do cry. Yes, there's always <laughs> tissues for <laughs> Especially she asked me, I know there's more people here that are from foreign countries coming with a family. Yes, mm -hmm. have the support that this wonderful woman that has helped me raise my kids and just been there for me through every single. Mm, uh, every single step of my way to parenthood and it's just I don't know what I would have done without this group of mom that have been there for me. Even if I'm missing one class, it's just nice to to receive a text message saying, Why are you here? Mm -hmm. Just to feel important for others that aren't blood related to me is it's very very I'm very grateful for this group of moms that are with me. There have been some great friendships that have come out of this group. Um, I think everybody's pretty comfortable talking. Um, and uh, like Lisette said, I mean, I can empathize with how she feels. Um, I don't have any family here. I have David's family here, but I don't have any of my own family here. And that's very, very difficult, especially when you're younger and raising a family. Um, so. Uh, it's great to see so many moms give so much support. Mm -hmm. It's a very accepting group to me because I too moved here. We moved here this fall and um, so yeah, it was a really great place for me just to start to get to know other women in the church and other moms and just to start developing those friendships. And it's just neat to have other people know who my kids are and just, you know, I know you're, you're still getting to know me, getting to know our kids, but it's just nice for them because we don't have family either. All of our families in the Midwest, so it's just nice for them to have people that kind of fill in as like those aunts or, you know, grandmas. And I just love, because my mom isn't there, I mean, we talk on the phone and, and whatnot, but my mom's not there. It's great to have the advice of women that are a little bit older, that have been there, that have raised kids in a different stages, you know, even a little bit above where I'm at so I can look to them. And I really appreciate all the wisdom. Um, and the compassion that is shown in the group is unbelievable. And it's fun. We laugh a lot. <laughs> <laughs>
Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons. Would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates me from you. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So far in our series on healthy relationships, we've talked about respect, trust, love, and learning to live in peace. And today I want to highlight four ingredients that sweeten all of our relationships. And the first of these, didn't that look delicious? I want to thank Sarah Kemp both for making the wonderful looking cake and for taking these photographs that we're going to use this morning. So thanks very much, Sarah. So four ingredients to sweeten all our relationships, C-A-K-E. And the first of these is compassion. Uh, I got so hungry looking at these pictures. <laughs> compassion is sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortune of others. Sympathetic pity or concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. When we have compassion for another person, we feel their pain. We're moved to help and we want to be of assistance. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is frequently portrayed as being full of compassion. In Mark chapter 6, and verse 34, it says, As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them. For they were like sheep without a shepherd. In Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 12, a, a man with leprosy, a terrible skin disease, comes to Jesus and begs him, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, reaches out and touches him and heals him. Compassion connects us to other people in their time of need. As Patty mentioned in the prayer this morning, we had a memorial service on Thursday for uh, Mary Jane Garneau's 37-year-old son, Sean. And afterwards, when we were in the fellowship hall, Mary Jane and numerous members of the family who were there express their gratitude for our Caring Heart to Heart team, our staff members, our AV people, uh, everyone whose compassion and care helped them at such a difficult time. And while I was sitting at the table with some of our Caring Heart to Heart volunteers uh, in the fellowship hall at the end, several of them mentioned how special it was to feel like you know, we were part of serving them and helping them, and they, how glad they were that they could do that. In the Bible story, Ruth had obviously bonded very closely with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she recognized how much she had suffered with the tremendous loss of both of her sons and her husband. And she had so much compassion for Naomi, she simply wasn't going to let her go back home alone, totally bereft of family. Compassion, the, cap the capacity 
To care for other people, especially when they're hurting, is vital to healthy relationships. When we're hurting emotionally or physically, that's often when we need love the most. One of the things my mother always said to me and my sisters was, be your best self. Be your best self. And our ability to show compassion often reflects our best self. And that compassion is not even limited to our care for other people. Compassion is what motivates folks who, like uh, Marissa Freeman, the folks who go out trying to rescue sea turtles or try to get dolphins back out into the ocean or when you find an injured animal and you want to get it to wild care. What motivates that? It's compassion. And when we have compassion in our heart, we want to alleviate suffering. And that's what Ruth wants to do for Naomi. That brings us to our second ingredient. <laughs> Second ingredient that sweetens our relationships, and that is acceptance. Think about the relationship between Naomi and Ruth. I gave you a little bit of the background between the Israelites and the Moabites. And sometimes we understand parents may not immediately and with great enthusiasm welcome the news that, guess what, their son or daughter is going to marry someone from a different culture and a different religion. Just be honest. And after her daughter-in-law, Orpah, had tearfully departed, Naomi tells Ruth, basically, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. And Ruth basically says, no way. I'm staying with you. And in families and in friendships and even with people we work with or go to school with, Healthy relationships require acceptance, often of people who think, believe, act, and feel quite differently than we do. And we also need to accept the fact that no one is perfect, including ourselves, and that we all have areas that we need to grow in, and perhaps even more challenging, especially in our families. That we may have to accept the fact that some of us have flaws we may never completely overcome. Acceptance is vital to healthy relationships because we learn that we are loved and cared for and we love and care for people for who they are as they are. Now, the opposite of genuine acceptance is a form of conditional love or conditional acceptance, which takes the forms of sayings and attitudes like, if you love me, you'll do this. Or, I'll love you as long as you do this. Or, in the ridiculousness of elementary school, if you do this, I'll be your best friend. You know? Or if you don't do this, you can't be my friend. All of these expressions are of conditional love, conditional friendship, or even just flat-out manipulation. Acceptance sweetens relationships because we know we're loved for who we are. A third ingredient that sweetens our relationships is kindness. Kindness. Kindness, to me, is truly one of the greatest things in the world. Isn't it awesome when someone does something for you that's kind? It just makes you feel so good. It's one of the greatest things in the world. And clearly, both Ruth and Orpah had sweetened the lives of their husbands and of Naomi so that Naomi can say with so much emotion and longing, I mean, can you picture this and hear this? May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. Oh, I mean, if that's a movie, can you hear the string section going in the background? Oh. And kindness is mentioned in so many verses in the Bible as one of the characteristics of God. 
And again, often I don't think we think about, what's one of the primary characteristics of God? God is kind. And I could give you a whole bunch of verses. I'm only going to share two. Nehemiah 9.17, which says, You are a God of forgiveness, gracious, and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. And in the New Testament, in Titus 3, beginning at verse 4, it says, When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy. Kindness is the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate. And there is a tremendous need for kindness in all relationships and in the world. Politics has become so full of angry, hateful speech. It's awful. It's awful. And the media in all its forms is dripping with hate, disdain, pontification, accusation, self-righteousness, and rage. And that's just against the patriots. <laughs> I have to admit, I laughed as I wrote that. Every time I looked at it, it made me laugh. You know, one of my favorite movies is the 1939 classic starring Jimmy Stewart called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Any of you seen that movie? It's a great movie. And in his famous filibuster on the scene, and he's on the floor of the Senate, he says, it seemed like a pretty good idea, getting boys from all over the country, boys of all nationalities and ways of living, getting them together, letting them find out what makes different people tick the way they do. Because I wouldn't give you two cents for all your fancy rules if behind them they didn't have a little bit of plain, ordinary, everyday kindness and a little looking out for the other fella, too. It's all right. But you know what's interesting is then Jimmy Stewart says very impassionately, that's pretty important, all that. It's just the blood and bone and sinew of this democracy that some great men handed down to the human race. That's all. And that everyday kindness is part of it. And that may sound quaint today, but kindness has never gone out of style. And I guarantee you, it brings a smile to people's faces, and it helps bond relationships as fast and strong as just about anything there is. Even in her overwhelming grief, Naomi cannot forget the kindness that Orpah and Ruth have shown to her and her sons. Kindness lives long in our memories, doesn't it? And that's why it sweetens our relationships. Compassion, acceptance, kindness, and finally, empathy. The first letters of those words, as you've seen, spell cake. And empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And the word empathy is often used when you're defining compassion. And empathy is important to our relationships because if we can't understand the feelings of another person, we're never going to develop some of the, th of the things we've talked about already in this series. If you can't learn to empathize with someone's feelings, it's harder to develop respect and trust and love. Now, we don't have to agree with someone. We don't even have to understand everything about someone in order to empathize with what they're feeling. Many of us need to learn how to listen better, including myself, to the feelings of someone. Listening to the feelings they're expressing, in, and that's both verbally and non-verbally. I was, I was down at the Lemon Tree Villages this week, and I was behind somebody in line at a store. And there were two, it was a husband and wife and their daughter, and they put on the counter, they said, you know, we're looking for 
something like this. It was a thing to hold, a hard-boiled egg. You know, one of those little things, you just put an egg in, that's all it holds. And he said, the closest thing we could find was this. And what was hysterical was, you know, the husband says, well, aren't they the same? And, and the wife looks at him like, and, and I, I kind of, I'm looking over their shoulder, and I just started laughing. And I said, can I help? I said, see, if you're a man, that's a thing that holds an egg. I said, if you're a woman, forgive me and don't email me about this, all right? I'm sorry. It's just me. I said, if you're a woman, you notice, well, this one is white. That one's actually gray. It's got a slight gray to it. And that one, the top, it frins out this way a little bit. And the other one, no, it's not as thick. And, and the, the, the wife and mother looks at me and says, exactly, exactly. And then I looked at the guy and I winked at him and I said, it just holds an egg. <laughs> but we have to learn to listen to people's feelings and what they're expressing, both verbally and non-verbally. And, and the phrase, he's clueless, she's clueless, often means we're not perceiving, recognizing, or empathizing with someone's feelings. And Ruth demonstrates her great commitment when she says to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. That's as great an expression of commitment as you'll find in the Bible from anyone. Ruth understands the depth of Naomi's loss. She has become a widow herself, and it's her sense of empathy that moves her to leave her homeland and to accompany Naomi safely back to Judah. Now, I don't have time to tell you all the rest of the story of Ruth. You can read it for yourself, and you can do it in less than probably 15 minutes. But what's interesting is the movement of the story of Ruth. If you picture it, the movie begins by going downward. There's no king, no food, eventually no sons, and emptiness. The story starts going down, down, down. Then the story moves upward as Ruth finds food gleaning in the field of a man named Boaz. And eventually, she and Boaz gets, get married and she has a new husband. And then there's even a new son named Obed. Not on the top three lists that came out this week for babies in the United States, but that was his name, Obed. And why is that significant? Because after Obed, eventually, there's even a king. Because Obed is the grandfather of David. That's right. Think about that. Ruth, a Moabite, is the great-grandmother of arguably the greatest king in Israel. And one of the fascinating things about the Bible is how the Bible pushes back on itself. Because later on, you can read stories in Ezra and Nehemiah, after the Israelites had been conquered and taken into exile and everything else, and there's some really, really harsh passages in Ezra and Nehemiah about how if you married a foreign woman, you got to get rid of her. Forget it. They're not worthy. And the Bible speaks back to Ezra and Nehemiah and says, you know what? Don't forget. The great-grandmother of King David was a Moabite. If we want to look for people in the Bible to be role models of healthy relationships, two of the best are an Israelite mother-in-law and her Moabite daughter-in-law. Would that the rest of us could live up to their example of compassion, acceptance, kindness, and empathy. And I have to say, I feel incredibly blessed on Mother's Day that the mother of my two sons embodies those four qualities as well as any person I've ever been blessed to know. And I want to encourage you, from now on, any time you have a piece of cake for dessert, 
I want you to remember Ruth and Naomi and their example of how compassion and acceptance and kindness and empathy sweetens all our relationships. Let's pray. God, Patty already prayed so beautifully all about moms and relationships and various circumstances. But God, you have placed the ability to be compassionate in all of our hearts, whether we're moms or not. And I pray that these four qualities would grow in each of our hearts and our lives and our relationships because I know what a difference they can make. We thank you for the people who have shared compassion and acceptance and kindness and empathy with us. And we know we can think of the names of people. And the people who have done that are the people we are probably closest to and the people we are happiest to see coming. So God, help us to be those kinds of people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.